we're today we're here to talk about Project Protect, um, or maybe some of you are just here because you're interested in learning how to identify amphibians. Um, so either either way, that's fine. Uh, but Project Protect is a Muskoka Conservancy program, and the Muskoka Conservancy is a Muskoka-based land trust. So we're based within Muskoka. We have a couple properties outside of it, but the majority of our properties are in Muskoka. We protect 45 properties currently, and that totals to be about over 500 acres of wetland protected in total. And I think we're quite close to 600 acres. Uh, and the really cool thing about our wetland acres is they provide habitat for every species of frog in that we find in Muskoka. So there's 10 species of frog and we have found all of them on our properties. Uh, it also provides habitat for salamanders and there's lots of uh, breeding birds, um, several of them species at risk as well. So we protect a lot of acreage and a lot of very interesting ecosystem for species at risk. Project Protect is our citizen science initiative. And I know a lot of people are kind of worried science is like a lot of test tubes and numbers and like really rigorous stuff. Citizen science is not. Uh, I am. I open this up to everyone and anyone. They don't, I don't require any sort of pre-knowledge or anything, any of the training happens during the program. And frog surveys especially are quite easy to, uh, to learn all the different calls. So also included in Project Protect outside of amphibian surveys are bird surveys as well. And I'll talk a little about, bit about those at the end, but there is a bird training coming up next week. Uh, so we'll be focusing more on that. Um, and it's based off the Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program, which is done by Birds Canada, which surveys uh, marshes across the Great Lakes Basin. So they have, you know, several down in Simcoe and, and around the Great Lakes. So we're, we've kind of adopted their program and we're running it very uh, in a similar way, but we're focusing on Muskoka Conservancy properties. Uh, and we're looking to include about nine properties in this program. I would love to do more, but some of them are pretty tricky access and most of the surveys take place at dawn or dusk. So I don't want volunteers, you know, having to bushwhack 15 minutes to find a swamp in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so for those of you who don't live close to our properties or uh, maybe we run out of properties, which would be a great problem to have, uh, I will find other suitable habitats to survey close by. Um, and I know a couple of people, I have uh, a surveyor up in Port, uh, Port Carling who has a marsh that's not uh, included in our properties. Uh, so I'll, I'll make it work if you want to, if you want to participate. Uh, okay, so we're going to go through some quick frog identification, frog and toad identification. We're focusing mainly on their calls because most of the time when you're surveying, that's all you're going to hear. But uh, it is good to know how to ID them by sight. There's been several times, especially in the early surveys, that while walking in between survey sites, I've seen frogs on the road. Um, so I had one, one year I had, I think, three wood frogs and two American toads on the road in between survey sites. So it's useful to know how to identify them uh, visually as well. But audio is going to be most of the focus uh, for the surveys. And I've ordered these, these frogs and toads in order of when they start calling. So the earliest callers, the ones that start in probably about three weeks, are going to be first, and then we're just gonna kind of go down uh, the, the list of them. So our first frog that starts calling, or there's kind of a group of three that start calling at a pretty similar times is the wood frog. <clears throat> wood frogs have a variable color. Most often you're gonna see that, that browner color, but there, there is variation. And many frogs and toads have variation in their coloring. The best thing to look for for the wood frog is the dark mask uh, on the frog. And let me just, I can do some drawing to make sure everyone sees where that is. The dark mask is right here. Um, so you're looking 
uh, right below the eye. And sometimes, as in this photo, you can actually see that the mask extends through the eye. Um, so it's a quite, quite a large mask, larger than we see in any other uh, frog or toad. And that's the easiest way to, to get a good sense of them. Um, sorry. Uh, they have a prominent dorsolateral ridge, and I'll highlight highlight that one as well. That's the ridge that runs from the eye to the back of the frog. Um, so you're you're going to see this on many of our frogs and toads, but not every single one of them. But this one is a, quite a prominent ridge, uh, and you'll be able to see that. Sometimes I bring binoculars to make it easier to ID some of the frogs, um, but you'll see that going all the way to the back of the legs. And their call is like a duck quacking. So I'm going to play that for you right now. And please let me know if you can't hear the audio. It should be set up, but sometimes there's issues. Best described as a series of harsh staccato quacks, the call of the wood frog, Rana sylvatica, is heard for a brief period in swampy woodlands in early spring. So that's, it's very similar to a duck quacking. And usually the first set of wood frogs that I hear, I assume are ducks. Uh, so kind of not quite as hearty as a duck might be or quite as loud. Um, that would be, that one is more than one frog. So you'll, often you'll hear just a single like set of quacks. But in that case, we heard multiple ones kind of uh, going at once. So yeah, that was multiple frogs. Uh, but yeah, it sounds like ducks quacking and it's it, you're usually finding them where you would find ducks. So uh, it's, it's a bit surprising, but often when you're in the field, it's pretty easy to say, oh, that's not a duck. <laughs> Best. Okay, next one, chorus frog. Uh, this one is our rarest frog and our most significant. It's the species at risk in Muskoka. So this is a pretty significant one to find on any property you're surveying. They have a white lip stripe, which is below this kind of reduced mask that they have. So you're gonna see that running from the tip of the nose all the way down to the legs, pretty much. The other thing to look for is this uh, set of parallel lines on the back. So you can't see the third, but they have three rows of kind of parallel lines running down the back. And that's an easy way to distinguish them between something like the spring peeper. Um, they have that reduced mask like the wood frog, but the wood frogs is much more significant. Uh, and the other thing to look for is the lack of a dorsolateral line. So remember in the, in the wood frog, we had that dorsolateral ridge running along its back. In this case, we can't see that. Um, because this is a species of tree frog, tree frogs don't have that dorsolateral line. Uh, so in this case, chorus frogs, spring peepers, and gray tree frogs are the ones that are going to be missing a significant dorsolateral ridge. And their call is like a thumb drawn along a comb. Uh, and you can, there is a tricky one with the spring peeper makes a similar call, but this is kind of monotonous. It doesn't have much of a rise or a lower in pitch. It's kind of just like if you were to drag your thumb along a, a comb, a nice kind of monotonous trill. The songs of the western chorus frog, Sudacris triceriata, and boreal chorus frog, Sudacris maculata, are virtually identical. Because the survey is based on identification by call, both species will be dealt with as one. The call is often most aptly described as resembling the sound of a finger drawn along the teeth of a comb. Note the slight rise in pitch and emphasis.
So the spring peeper is going to have a somewhat similar call to that, uh, not the normal one you hear, but it's got kind of like an alarm call that's kind of similar, but it's going to have, it's going to be shorter and have more of a rise at the end. Um, so yeah, that one, again, more than one frog, but that kind of, there is a slight variation in the pitch, but it's, it's mostly monotonous. And again, kind of the rarest one you're going to find. So I always recommend that if you think you're hearing them, try to get a recording in the field because that's the best way to, to verify for sure. Um, but when you hear a lot of chorus frogs and spring peepers, if you listen to their calls several times, you can start easily kind of distinguishing between the two of them. And at the end of the presentation, we have, um, there's another citizen science project, not through the Conservancy, but we're kind of working with them. Um, and they have a very good quiz on chorus frogs versus spring peepers. So I'll set, I'll be sending that around as well. So here's our spring peeper. This is probably the one that everyone is quite familiar with. It's pretty much everywhere. It's got an X shape mark on the back. So you can see that right there, um, that X shape on the back of the frog. And uh, it also has a triangular marking between the eyes. And so sometimes this is like that V that you can see in this picture, but sometimes it'll be an actual triangle. So this whole section will be filled in. So you'll see both on spring peepers, but you're looking for that cross on the back and a triangular V-shaped mark on the in between the eyes. You can also see somewhat obvious toe pads on it. But again, if you're not using binoculars or you're not super close to the frog, it's better to look at the, the back markings. The call is a short peep. We've all heard it. Um, there is a, they do this kind of alarm per call, which I'll be sending out a bit later because it's better to be listening to that and the chorus frog quite close together so you can hear the different, um, different call. It looks like it has, it doesn't have, oh, I see. So you're, so th I think this is just a, a shading mark. A dorsolateral ridge will most likely run like that. So this one also doesn't have a dorsolateral ridge. You might see some, a kind of an edge right here. And you'll, you might see that in several different species of frog, a kind of edge. But the ridge is, is kind of, uh, it's, if you were to touch a frog, you can feel that, that rise in the back. Um, and this is more just uh, the shape or potentially the shadowing on the frog. Um, so we'll listen to the peep. I'm sure everyone's heard it, but it's a good thing because you'll start hearing it pretty soon. <laughs> With the first warm evenings of early spring, the spring peeper, Sudacris crucifer, advertises its presence with a high-pitched ascending peep. In ideal habitat and weather, calling males can be so numerous that their loud chorus drowns out all other sound. In the following example, individual spring peepers are heard first, followed by a chorus. At other times, peepers will advertise their presence with a short trill perique, usually rising in pitch at the end. This call can be confused with that of the chorus frog, but can be distinguished as it is more of a trill and rises in pitch at the end. So that last call can be confused with the chorus frog. It tends to be shorter and has more of a rise at the end. Um, and I think of it as a, like kind of perik. Uh, so yeah, I, I will be sending out audio files for all these. And that's a good one to listen to the two differences because uh, they can be a little tricky when you're out in the field. Um, ice out. So yes, uh, I don't know where the ice, I think most of the big lakes are frozen. Uh, but, and I'll talk about this a little later as well, the frogs will start calling before 
the wetlands are de-iced. So I did a survey two years ago where half the wetland was frozen still and half was open and the number of spring peeper, peepers calling was insane. So uh, this the calling windows are not necessarily decided by the state of the wetland. It tends to be decided by uh, nighttime temperatures. So we'll be talking about the different specific temperatures you should be going out and, and listening at. Uh, next up is the American toad. So those first three we talked about, you hear all of them in April. So our wood frog, chorus frog, spring peeper, you can hear them kind of mid-April going into May. The American toad, uh, your second survey is about mid-May and you should be able to get them if there's some around. Um, but I don't, they tend not to be heard in April. So you're looking for like start of May for the American toad. Uh, there's, it's, uh, it's really our only toad that we have. So it's somewhat easier to identify than the frogs. So there's nothing much to worry about. You can see all these black spots on it. They all have warts in them. It tends to have a wart in almost every single black spot that it has. Uh, and then the other good thing to look for is the paratoid gland. So they have this gland right behind the eye. You can see this, this raised bump. Um, that's a great thing to look for in toads that kind of immediately distinguishes them from any sort of frog. So look for that raised lump behind the eye. And if you were to look at the belly, there'd also be kind of a white or cream modeling on the underside. Uh, but often you're not gonna be able to see that unless you like lift up the toad. Uh, so the paratoid gland is a pretty good thing to look for. And I mean, most of us have probably seen a warty toad and can pretty easily identify it. The only tricky ones are the, are the really young ones when they're not getting, they're not quite as warty. And their call is this really, really long high pitch trill. And it's going to tell you in the recording, but they call at different pitches. So if a first male starts calling at one pitch, the second one that joins in will call at a lower or a higher pitch. And they're like 30 seconds long or up to 30 seconds long. So they can be calling for quite some time. Found in a wide variety of habitats, the American toad, Bufo americanus, sings a musical monotone trill up to 30 seconds in length. If you listen carefully, there is an introductory note slightly lower in pitch. When several males are calling, each male will sing at a slightly different pitch from his nearest neighbors. What does the paratoid gland do? I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> uh, I'll have to look that up and get back to you because I'm I I'm not positive what what that gland actually does. Um, I think it may be used in mating, but I I'll double check and make and make sure, um, and I'll send that out. Oh, perfect. Neurotoxins versus pre predators, um, and the. That's kind of somewhat common in toads, the cane toad down in Australia, uh, which is their super invasive toad that is everywhere there, um, is quite toxic. And that paratoid gland is, is most likely the case. So yeah, long, long trail. There, it, the trail is almost forgotten when you're out in the field because, because of its length. So you really have to tune your ears to be listening for like this really long trail amongst all the other frogs calling. Next up is our, le our leopard frog. These are again, going to be one of those May frogs. They're leopard frog, green frogs and bullfrogs can be tricky um, identifications because of their variability in color. If you get one that looks like this, it's pretty, like, it's pretty unmistakable, uh, bright green with all the spotting. Uh, but there are ones that have less spotting and then you can start getting into those issues with uh, misidentifications with green and bull, bullfrogs. So things to look for is there are all these spots on the back. They tend to be more kind of circular. 
uh, a long dorsolateral ridge, that kind of cream colored ridge running all the way to the back. Um, and they have a white line from snout to shoulder. So again, kind of similar to our chorus frog that had the white lip line. Um, that's the other thing to look for in leopard frogs, that, that light line going from snout to shoulder. Uh, and again, some might have few spots, some might have more spots than this guy, uh, but you're looking for those kind of more circle to square shaped spots on the frog. And the call of the leopard frog is quite interesting. It's like, uh, I, I always think of it as a two-part call. One part is a creaky door opening. Like if you, you know, like in horror movies, you have the door slowly swinging open. So that's what I think the first part kind of sounds like. And then the second part is like a ghost, kind of a creepy ghost uh, laughing at you. Uh, and you'll kind of, they're, they're going to talk about it as like a snore and a chuckle or something, I think. But I always think, I like to think of it as like a creepy door and then this ghost laughing at you being really scared of it. Uh, but again, different mnemonics for different people. Uh, whatever works best for you. <laughs> uh, so here you go. The song, if it can be called that, of the leopard frog, Rana Pipians, sounds like a guttural snore lasting about three to four seconds followed by several equally guttural short clucks. Again, uh, they call it a guttural snore and clucks. I like to think of it as a door and a ghost. Uh, sometimes they'll only do the first part of the call, so the door part of the call. Uh, but most often you'll hear some space before they do the, the creepy ghost laughing. Uh, so whatever works better better for you. But I've, I've always thought about it that way, and it makes it very easy to get it when you the first time you hear them in May it's much easier to kind of just for me to click in and, and realize it's a leopard frog. Our next one is a pickerel frog. This is one of our more uncommon uh, frogs. You'll see these in kind of water lily, open water marshes. And the, the neatest thing to notice about them is their spots are more rectangular, more square and rectangular. So even this kind of spotting down the side, you can see more of a square shape to it. So they're not going to have those circular spots like we see on the leopard frog. And on their back, they have two parallel rows of spots. So you see the first and the second one there. So it's going to be two parallel rows of rectangular spots. Again, if you can get the underside of the frog, which sometimes you can, sometimes you can't, I wouldn't recommend grabbing every frog you see. But if you do have your binoculars or something, they do have a yellow groin and inner thighs. So that's another good way to identify them. And their call is a low snore. So they talk, when the recordings talk about a bunch of different snore calls, so I like to distinguish a couple of the different ones so I don't think, oh, is this the leopard frog snore or is this the pickerel frog snore? Um, so this one sounds more like a snore to me. And uh, it's quite kind of, yeah, this one sounds like exactly like a snore to me. Similar to the leopard frog, but faster in cadence and slightly higher pitched, the steady snore of the pickerel frog, Rana palustris, lacks the additional notes of the leopard frog. that last one being quite a, <laughs> a deep snore. But yeah, a nice kind of longer snore. I think that to me sounds just like a snore. Um, so 
that one is a pretty easy ID. And again, you're going to find them kind of in those open water marshes. They're a bit rarer in Muskoka. Um, you'll also find them kind of on the fast or not fast flowing, but creeks. You can find them in, in kind of cold, colder creeks. Uh, next one is our tree frog. So this guy is one of our tree frogs. So is lacking that dorsolateral ridge. So we don't have that on it. This one has, uh, okay, I've got 10 minutes left, just a note, and then I'll send out the link to everyone. I should be able to get through all the IDs. Uh, so this has got a very variable color, green, brown, gray, huge mix of colors on these guys. You'll find them most likely uh, out, like more up in trees than any of the other frogs. It has a, this darker stripe here um, that goes down to the leg, but I find large toe pads is a pretty easy one that there's not, it's more of like a modeling on the back, not a spot or any sort of shape, uh, where when we look at the kind of the other tree frogs, our spring peeper and chorus frog, there's actual like lines and shapes on the back, whereas the gray tree frog is more just a modeling. Um, and I would always say, look for these guys, or when you're listening, you'll usually hear them up in trees. So all the other frogs you're going to hear down in the wetland, but the, the gray tree frogs you're going to actually hear up in the trees. So I usually, like, when I'm listening for them, I say, like, is it up in a tree? It's most likely a chorus frog. And they have kind of like this bird-like trill, and you're going to hear them compare it to that of a red-bellied woodpecker. Um, and it's not quite as bird-like as an actual bird. Um, and red-bellied woodpeckers are pretty infrequent uh, in, in Muskoka. Singing throughout the spring and well into summer, a short resonating bird-like trill of the tetraploid gray tree frog, Hyla versicolor, is a familiar sound to anyone who ventures into the countryside in the evening. The call is somewhat reminiscent of the red-bellied woodpecker. Let's compare the two. First the woodpecker, then the gray tree frog. Well, that sounds more like a bird to me. And again, red-bellied woodpeckers are quite infrequent in Muskoka. So usually if you hear kind of that trilly call, it'll be a, a gray tree frog. So green frog is one of our easier ones aud um, aud using audio to ID. Um, it's got a very long dorsolateral ridge. You can see it going right down from the eye, quite pronounced as well. It has very variable colors. So this is a brown. You'll see much greener ones. I think there's been reports of like blue ones in the past. So huge variation in color. Uh, and then throat or uh, cross bands on the thighs. So it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but they have lines that kind of cross the thighs. The other thing to note about them and how it's or how to tell them apart from a bullfrog is the bullfrog's dorsolateral ridge will fold down this way. So really the best thing to do is look for this dorsolateral ridge on the frog. And if you see a really distinct one, it's a green frog. And their call is just this gunk. It's like gunk, gunk. Um, and so we're gonna listen to that. The explosive throaty gunk of the green frog, Ranoclamatans, sounds like a plucking of a loosely tuned Oh, banjo string. In the following example, individual green frogs are heard first, followed by a chorus. The green frog may also give several stuttering guttural calls, followed by a single staccato gunk, 
This call can be mistaken for that of a bullfrog. However, the green frog's call is shorter, not as rhythmic, nor as deep. Almost always has a gunk in there too, so if you're hearing that kind of more guttural call, um, just wait for it to gunk, basically. Bullfrogs are really distinct in their calls. Um, so yeah, that gunk, it kind of sounds like almost like a pluck of a off-tune guitar or violin string or something like that. Next one is mink frog. Uh, this is, uh, we just got two frogs left. So this one is very modeled on the back. You can see right here, there's no spotting or anything like that. It's just super modeled. Um, often you'll see this orangey color as well, potentially. Um, they're really quite a gorgeous frog to see. Uh, you'll see larger blotching on the back legs, but this modeling is so distinct that it's kind of like hard to ID it as anything else because all the other frogs we're looking at are going to have some amount of spotting on them. And it does have a dorsolateral ridge, but it's quite indistinct. Um, it, it isn't a tree frog, so it does have one, but it's a very unpronounced uh, ridge. This one sounds like a hammer striking wood. I always think of it as like a cut, 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 like kind of a triplet. Um, so a bit of a different call for a frog to have. The burry cut, cut, cut of the mink frog, Rana septentrionalis, is given in rapid series. It is reminiscent of the distant sound of a hammer striking wood. Listen for it where water lilies are plentiful. So yeah, often a, a kind of a triplet or a quadruplet, you hear that cut, 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 cut. Okay, and I think this is our last one, the American bullfrog. Um, I should have just enough time for this before we move on to the survey. The dorsolateral ridge folds right here, folds around the tympanum, which is this uh, eardrum they have there. So you're not going to see it go all the way down the the back. They also have cross banding on the thighs. You can see it a little bit better in this picture. But honestly, looking for this dorsolateral ridge is probably the easiest thing. The other thing is they have quite a sharp kind of angle to their back or their backside. So this very sharp looking angle. Um, so you can see it almost better in the background where it's quite quite sharp. And when you kind of see them sitting on something, you'll see see that pretty. Um, obviously. So their their call is this low like rum um, and it's it's very diagnostic. It, it, you can almost like feel it. Um, so I'm going to play that for you. Carrying long distances, the deep bass rum of the bullfrog, Rana Catesbiana, is familiar to nearly everyone. It can be heard well into the summer. Yeah, very low kind of like guttural noise. Um, kind of a low, really low hum, I guess, is a way to think about it. Um, okay, so procedures, how to survey. This is kind of the meat of the uh, training stuff, which we're looking at exactly how we're surveying and how we're identifying all these frogs. So first of all, where to survey. This is something you probably don't need to worry about too much, um, mainly because I'm going to be the one assigning all the different um, sites to everyone. So it's not going to be a huge problem um, for you to knowing exactly where to survey, but essentially where you want to survey is just a marsh. So uh, we're looking at any sort of wet area. The Great Lakes Marsh Monitoring Program is more marsh focused, we're kind of saying marshes are fine, 
swamps are fine, anywhere where we might actually get frogs. Uh, and so that that will be pretty easy to kind of tell when I send out a site, it'll be very easy to say, oh yeah, I know exactly where I need to survey because there's this giant wet area here. Um, and mainly what you're when you're looking at where to survey, it's where you're putting, you're, you're surveying this semicircle, so 180 degrees. So that's how you're going to be deciding kind of where, where you're ending up surveying. So uh, again, kind of any wet area, large, large swamp, large marsh, and I will be picking all the sites for you. Um, so you'll just have to, I'll, I'll most likely, if you haven't done this before, I'll probably be coming out with you in your first survey to give you a bit of lay of the land and, and figure out exactly uh, the specific survey sites. So our survey procedures is we're surveying at three different temperatures and they're not like super hard lines. Uh, I'll be emailing everyone when I think surveying can start. Uh, so surveys are five degrees Celsius, 10, and then 17 degrees Celsius. And your five degrees Celsius is going to catch those first three frogs we talked about, the wood frog, the chorus frog, the spring peeper, that May survey, which is around when we have 10 degrees Celsius, um, is going to be your leopard frog, pickerel frog, and then your 17 degrees is going to catch that, the, the latest one, which is usually kind of the bullfrog, because I've heard green frogs in my second survey. So the third survey is more for almost bullfrogs, mink frogs. Um, and those are nighttime temperatures. So I like, for example, we've already had like a 15 degree day um, and we're up in the positives now, but we're looking for the nighttime temperature to be about five degrees. So that's gonna be, it tends to be middle of April, middle of May, middle of June. But again, as soon as I start hearing spring peepers and stuff, I'll start sending emails out to, to everyone say, okay, try to arrange your next survey in the next, you know, four or five days, I'm hearing frogs calling. And it, like I said before, it's kind of deceptive to think that, oh yeah, we'll have to wait till everything opens up. No, they'll start, as soon as there's some open water, the whole wetland doesn't need to be open. But as soon as there's any sort of open water, the frogs might start calling. Uh, time of day, we want one half hour after sunset. So this is why I tend to come out on the first survey and I pick points that are fairly easy to access because I don't want people bushwhacking in to get to a property. Uh, I'd like people, you know, be able to get out of their cars once they've parked safely and be able to survey quite quickly. Uh, so I re always recommend being at your first survey site quite early um, because they're, tends to be some amount of like finding your way. April is a great time to get a good sense of the lay of the land around your survey sites because May and June are very buggy and you are right next to a wetland. So once you get the lay of the land on your first two surveys, it's nice to, you know, go in and say, I know, or, know where it is. I'm going to go in quickly, get there, do my survey and get out because the bugs are awful. Um, and I, I've been, I've done some bird surveys and some frog surveys where the bugs are really quite painful. Uh, so I always be, get there in April, get a good sense in April, and then May and June are your quick get in, get out. Um, so I don't get eaten alive. Surveys only last three minutes. And I say like <laughs> three minutes seems like a really short time. And in April, it is going to seem like a really short time. And you're going to say, oh, I want to serve for survey for 15 minutes. And I fully encourage people to survey for longer, but I can guarantee in May and June, three minutes is going to seem like a much longer time. Um, so uh yeah that that three minute survey is is going to be a long one in may because you're going to be getting eaten alive so make sure that when you're when you're surveying take time on your first survey to understand exactly where your points are and then make it quick for the other two and again you're free to survey for 15 minutes if you'd like but may and june tend to be quite buggy uh, especially where you are other notes, um, try to avoid windy days. Calling activity is going to be greatly reduced during um, any sort of windy night. I've 
and I've like been out. I picked a day with a volunteer and it was hard for us to find a time and we went out anyways and it was windy and we heard nothing and there should have been at least peepers and there, there was there was nothing calling. So uh, try to I try to pick sites close to you so that you can quickly arrange a time. Uh, one surveyor, one recorder, I I almost require two people to be out in the field because it's going to be kind of not dangerous, but you're, you know, out in the dark. So it's good to have two set, two people there, two sets of eyes um, and, you know, a, a backup person so that, you know, if something happens, you have support there. And again, I'd like to most likely come out with you on your first survey if you haven't done this before. Um, and for some of you, like maybe you're surveying super close to your heart, your house, and you're like, I don't really need, I feel comfortable having no one else here. Uh, so, sorry, I'm just getting work calls. Um, so, yeah, I just two people is always best. But if you if you are close and you feel very comfortable, I can work with just one person. But again, if it's like, if you want to survey with a friend and you want to bring the friend out, great. But I can also arrange to find a second surveyor in your area. Uh, the other thing, fill out your survey sheets during and shortly after the survey. Because I have done this in the past and think I can remember stuff, I can't. So when you get back to the car, I would, you know, close the doors, shut the windows so you're not getting eaten alive, but fill out your survey sheet there, add any of the necessary information. Uh, bring things to bring, pen, pencil, watch. I use my smartphone instead of a watch, uh, but anything to, to track that three minutes. Uh, clipboard, because it's much easier to write with that. Uh, headlamp, because when you're exiting, it's going to be dark and bug repellent or whatever you need to deal with, you know, 50 mosquitoes attempting to carry you off. Uh, Cause that may be what happens. If you're serving a roadside, it might not be as bad, but there are some like, you know, slightly in the bush and all of a sudden you're, uh, you're swatting, swatting mosquitoes instead of listening to frogs. Uh, this is what your survey data looks like. Uh, we're gonna talk about the call codes in a second. And uh, yeah, it's it's pretty easy and not all the information is like super necessary. So things that you're looking, like things that I absolutely need from you um, is the start time. Like that's kind of the most crucial thing. Uh, this, I, I love having a background noise code and I need one, but Often your sites are not gonna have a lot of background noise. So if you end up forgetting to do it, it's not the end of the world. This is probably like, I would not even really worry about that. I know where all your sites are and I know the angles that you're looking at. If you can do it in the field, like you have a compass on your phone or something, that's great. But uh, I, I wouldn't say like, that's an absolute necessity. I know where all your survey points are. So I can always fill that in afterwards. This is always super good. Like, I kind of need this. Um, otherwise, I don't know what frogs are calling. They also have like this in out thing. Um, I wouldn't worry about that. And I'll be sending out the data sheets to everyone. I usually like you can you can figure this out from just looking at this sheet, right? Like this is out of your survey circle. This is out of your survey circle. So. I don't, I don't necessarily need you to fill that out. So the most, the, the key things are this and this, like that's what I absolutely need from you. Um, we'll talk about the calling codes in the, and, and again, yeah, write, write notes if you'd like. If you hear a frog before your survey and you don't have it during your survey, write a little note, say I heard a spring peeper before survey and, and it didn't call during the survey. So for your calling codes, um, this is how we count our amphibians. There's three different codes. Uh, they're pretty easy. And once you're in the field, it'll make a lot more sense. Uh, code one is you can count each individual frog and they're not calling at the same time. So that's like a group of like one or two spring peepers, like peeping 
off each other. So one's like peep, 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 peep. So you can hear them. They're not calling at the same time. You can count how many there are. Usually when we're looking at that first code, um, it's going to be like a one dash one. So calling code one with one individual or one dash two, calling code one with two individuals. You're very rarely going to have a one dash three because as soon as you get three frogs calling, they're kind of calling simultaneously. So you're going to move that to a call, calling code two. So yeah, list, uh, it goes code and then individuals. So usually 1-1, one 1-2, dash one, one dash you're not going to get 1-3 too much. Uh, the only thing you might get it with is like spring peepers because they have a short enough call that you might be able to hear all three of them individually. Code 2 is uh, calls are distinguishable, but some are simultaneously calling. A good example would be American Toad. So you've, you've one trilling at a low pitch and then a second one joins at a higher pitch. They're calling at the same time, and you can distinguish how many there are, but um, and they're not, but they are simultaneous. So um, again, you'd list number of individuals. So that might be like two dash two, like two. They're distinguishable, distinguishable, but simultaneous, and there's two individuals. Or like you might have two dash five or something. Like you can hear five green frogs, but they're kind of calling at the same time. Um, so like you have like four or five gunks going in like, um, succession, like five, I tend to have a number that's like two to four here. Cause that's about how many you can really tell. Uh, but like, I think, uh, on the previous slide, they even have like potentially eight or something. So, um, list and it's a best estimate if you like, if you can't really like if you know there's like four or five and you can distinguish them, but you think there's like, there's either four, or there's five, you're not sure. It's not a big, like write whatever you think is the best one. And then calling code three um, is just going to be the number three. You're not going to have any individuals. And this is like that full chorus wall of sound spring peeper that you're like, I don't know, there are spring peepers here. And there's a lot of them. Uh, so if we look back at our previous slide, um, you can see here there's that spring peeper 2-6, right? So there's there's spring peepers calling. You can distinguish them, but they're calling at the same time, and there's six of them. Um, this is that one one. There's one wood frog calling by itself. Here we have that chorus of chorus frogs. That means there's just there's too many to count, or you can't distinguish the different calls. They're just like huge numbers of chorus frogs. Um, and then, you know, same deal here. This is Northern Leopard Frog. Again, short form is not necessary. You can just write Leopard Frog or Wood Frog or like however you want to list what they are. Um, like four letter codes, I think I have included or I will include what they are, but I don't require you to learn them like what if you just want to write peeper in if you want to write like sp for spring peeper however you want to do it as long as i can distinguish them um pretty easily and then yeah like there's your wall of sound spring peepers like just huge amounts of them i'm not going to be able to count them and i would say in muskoka you're like calling code three spring peeper is like the most frequent thing you have like i often the first time i surveyed one site and that was when the wetland was half frozen I, there was so many spring peepers calling, I thought I was going to go deaf. Like, it was just this huge wall of sound. Um, oh, okay. So, for these four four letter codes, um, oh, this is going to really take my writing skills on the computer. So, that SP, PE. So, for the those of you unfamiliar with four letter codes, um, and if you're doing the bird training, we're going to talk about these as well. This is, yeah, someone wrote it very well, but spring. So there's your SP deeper PE. So the way four letter codes work in most cases is it's the first two letters of the first word and the first two letters of the second word. Um, so right here, you've got wood frog, uh, 
chorus frog. Now, when there's three letter words, it tends to be first letter of the first word, first letter of the second word, and the first two letters of the third word. So we have northern leopard frog. So again, I don't require you to learn those. It's a fun little thing to learn, and it's uh, bird surveyors use them very frequently. Um, so like B, C, C, H, black cap chickadee. So um, bird surveyors use this a lot. So it's a useful thing to kind of pick up, but I'm not requiring you to learn them like right off the bat because it, it is like an extra element. Um, like you can write leopard frog or leopard or like sp for spring peeper as long as i can tell as, as long as i can tell the difference it's fine um okay we got one last thing and then i'm going to open it up to, for questions uh one other opportunity blazing star environmental is conducting a pilot survey for western chorus frogs and i have 14 sites i've got 14 sites in muskoka um, and most of them correspond to sites that i'm doing uh, project protect on and what they're doing is they're surveying for only chorus frogs and it's between 10 a.m and 6 p.m so this is outside of when we would normally survey for frogs um, and the reason is they did a study and found that western chorus frogs appear to call more frequently or they call evenly between the day and the night but because there are more frogs calling at night sometimes the chorus frogs are missed. So they're saying call or survey during the day because tends to only be chorus frogs calling and there's less noise. So if you're interested in that, what it's gonna, it's gonna require three surveys and they're all gonna be done within like about a three week period. And I am happy, I don't quite know how this is gonna work, whether I'll be doing some of it for work or not. Um, but I am happy to like hand off, like here's a, a section of three sites and how to do them. Instead of a three minute survey, it's a five minute survey and you're only surveying for chorus frogs. So this is a more contact me if you're interested. I don't wanna add like additional surveys to your plate, but if you think you might have time for that and you're interested in like surveying for specifically a species at risk, like let me know and I can say, well, here are three sites nearby you like you need to do these all forward along the information and and here's some like training stuff uh it's very similar to ours it's just a five minute count as opposed to a three minute um so yeah contact me if you're interested i'm gonna send some of their information to everyone anyways because they have a really good kind of like frog quiz on chorus frogs versus spring peepers um and they've got some good stuff on that so if you're interested send me an email um yeah at at info dot info at muskoka conservancy dot org okay so that's it birds bird training is next week which i think several of you are participating in but if you have any questions about the amphibian surveys please let me know and the next steps is i will be emailing all the project protect people um those of you who had sites in previous years, I'll be asking if you want to continue doing that site. And those of you who didn't, I will be arranging a site for you to survey. Um, so I'm open to questions. If you have a question, just like raise your hand in Zoom or just like unmute and say it. There's only like 15 people here. So um, however you want to do that. <laughs> Martha, did you have a question? I do. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, I missed the first session on amphibians. I don't feel competent yet to do the survey for the big survey. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the, I mean, that's, that's the nuts of it. Yeah, <laughs> so um, to allay some of your fears, uh, the first survey was, or the first training was the same as this. So it was, it was not a separate training. 
Um, I will be sending the audio calls to everyone. You'll have the MP3s and can listen in your own time. Um, and I'll be going out with you on the first survey. And to help you with this, there's only going to be three frogs calling during your first survey. You're going to have spring peepers. If you're lucky, you'll have chorus frogs and you'll have wood frogs. That's pretty much the limit. So what you can do with the MP3s is you can focus on a group of frogs, like those first three, learn those. Next ones, like for the second survey, there's like four more frogs that you might need to know. So you can kind of parcel it in a way that it's not going to be too intimidating. Um, but if you don't feel comfortable, I'm more than happy to come out with you on all of your surveys and help you with that. Um, so when we have two surveyors, there's a surveyor who's doing all the frog call like identification and then a recorder who's just recording the information. So right. if you'd like me to come out survey for you and you can record, I can do that and then hand it off to you when you feel comfortable. Um, I really just wanna get people interested in the program. Um, and so however I can make it work for you is fine. Or if you wanna wait a year and spend some time learning, that's fine. Or I can offer another amphibian training session if people are still feeling uncomfortable and, and do it that way as well. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, um, I will be following up with all of you. Um, and if you don't want to do the program, that's also fine. Um, like, I, I want, you know, if, if you want to uh, join the program, I'd love it. If you don't feel comfortable, that's perfectly all right. Um, but I'll, I'll be sending a following follow up email with uh, this webinar. Um, so you can rewatch it if you'd like. I'll be adding the MP3 files, uh, probably a survey sheet so you can look at the data sheet um, and kind of some other pertinent information to help you get uh, used to what you might be doing. And then I'll also be touching base with all of the past surveyors, checking in on whether they'd like to continue with their survey site or if they'd like a different one or if they don't want to survey it anymore. And then all any of the new surveyors, I will be contacting you about sites. Uh, if you want to like send me a quick email where you're located, I'd love that so I can start preparing that. But I'm going to send out a nice like summary email about all this information as soon as I can get these up on YouTube, um, and we'll go from there. So I'm thanks everyone for participating. I hope to see all of you in the field this year. Uh, COVID restrictions allowing. Um, it's looking like we should be able to do it. So uh, I'm very excited for the program. Thanks for uh, joining us.